Hello and welcome to Cool Stuff by Simplified. My name is Gurjot and my name is Michael and this is episode 3. In this episode we spoke to cool man Philip Mann. Not his actual title. His actual title because he created a cool marketplace for cool watches. <laughs> he ended up founding an online marketplace for luxury watches at the age of 21 with over 80 million dollars in venture funding. Now that's a lot of venture funding for a really cool project. So <laughs> I think I think it's worth to listen to this guy. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cool Man Philip, Philip Mann. Man. So Philip, could you quickly tell us what is it that you do? Sure. So uh, I'm the founder or one of the founders of Chronext. Um, Chronext is a full service marketplace for luxury watches online. Um, how does it work? We have over 900 retailers and uh, hundreds of um, private sellers who, who sell their luxury watches through us. Uh, we take care of the pre-sale service, after-sale service, logistics, payment and authentication. So you essentially have a marketplace in the background, but you have the benefit of um, having everything from one party. Uh, the whole transaction is kind of carried out in a way that feels like a normal online shop. Um, and as a result, you have guaranteed authenticity, a great experience and a large selection uh, while having better prices than, than offline. Um, and yeah, maybe a quick, quick background on Chronix. We um, started the business uh, four years and one month ago, uh, actually in Switzerland in Zug. And um, oh, wow. okay. yeah, so we are we're 100, just under 150 people in, in four geographies and uh, raised uh, just under 20 million dollars to date in, in venture funding. Oh wow, that's incredible. And uh, so, if I understand correctly, it's just like an Amazon for luxury watches. Uh, in a very simple way, yes. Um, yeah. Amazon usually, I mean, yes, you can compare it to the Amazon kind of marketplace, Amazon marketplace, yes. Okay. And how did you differentiate yourself from other watch marketplaces online? Sure. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of regional players, but actually there at the time when we started and, and still today, there's no one-stop shop solution for uh, luxury watches online. And you have a lot of kind of sites that, uh, that are classified, so a little bit like uh, Ricardo in Switzerland, for instance. Uh, however, they only do the lead gen. So they only generate leads um, and they initiate the sale uh, of the watch uh, online, but actually most of the transactions are um, kind of finalized offline. Or if they're done online, they're not really, they're, they're not, there's no authenticity guarantee, there's no insurance, etc. So it's always kind of an adventure to, to buy a watch on other sites. Um, and if you think about it, that it's that, that a can, you know, mechanical fine timepiece easily costs 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 francs, euros, or, or pounds, whichever currency you think in. Um, you don't really want an adventure, but you actually want an authentic uh, timepiece in the condition as advertised, uh, with no hassle and kind of no, no bad surprises. So um, that is our clear differentiator. Uh, we have 21,000 watches online. We ensure that you have a great experience while being kind of uh, have, having 100% peace of mind when you buy from us um, and as a result we can very quickly uh, to probably be the largest reseller of watches online in, in the EU right now and uh, hopefully also uh, in the US within the next 24 to 36 months. And I believe all these issues that you raised like there's no surprises at the end of the transaction it's really important given how you're you're not just buying I don't know uh, a flash drive online which costs like 10 bucks you're actually spending a lot of money to buy a luxury watch. Absolutely. I mean, uh, our, our average price, depending on the month, is usually somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 euros per item. So if you think well, about that, uh, after the house, <laughs> after a car, um, and depending whether you have some art or not, that is probably one of the most expensive assets that, that most of our customers ever buy, let alone probably the most expensive thing they've ever bought online. Um, and it's yeah. not something that people just you know randomly buy, but it's actually a purchase that people think through long time, a lot of people save a lot of money for it for over a longer time period. So, you know, it's something that people take very seriously. And as a result, we wanted to create an experience that uh, reflects the importance and kind of um, gravity or, or, or weight of, of, of this purchase decision. You said you had a huge number of products available. Yeah. Now, how does it work? How do you end up buying from these suppliers and selling it with a decent margin? Do you have to negotiate independently? How does it work? Yeah, so 
Um, the biggest chunk of the business is uh, retailers and brands directly that uh, sell anonymously for us. So, like I said, we take care of the whole operations and the logistics side for them. Um, and how it worked at the beginning, we, we actually you know we went into shops and said, look, we'll, we'll take your inventory online. We'll take pictures of it. Uh, pic we we'll take pictures of it and we'll sell it for you. Um, and um, essentially, you start negotiating fixed commissions with them. Uh, these obviously change over time depending on the scale that, that we operate at. Um, but actually, at the end of the day, it's, it's individual agreements with all these retailers. Um, and that is actually the most difficult part to, to scale the business at. Is there a reason you decided to focus on luxury watches? Um, actually, so coincidentally, when we started, we actually wanted to sell university books, so student books. Um, oh, wow. The reason for that was we, um, my, my co-founder and I, we, we went to King's College London um, and we were sitting in a finance lecture and um, somebody explained or a professor explained the kind of basics of financial markets, how these work. And we thought actually it's quite a cool model to really understand how stock markets work. Um, and if you think about it, it's super frustrating as a student, at least at the time when we studied, to buy these books at the beginning of the year for every module. They're extremely expensive, and then at the end of the year, they're almost worthless. You have these books lying all over your flat, and um, they're, they're, they're super expensive. There's a lot of money tied up, and there's no good way to sell them. So we thought, okay, we'll make it cool to, to buy, sell um, uni books, and that you will be able to trade them like a, like a stock, and you'll see how the price obviously changes over the year. Probably they're more expensive <laughs> at the beginning of the year, right? Um, and then yeah. they get cheaper towards the end of the year, probably with a peak in price or whatever before exams, right? Because somebody, you'll always realize you don't have this one book before the exams. <laughs> so we thought, okay, that's such a cool idea. Basically, you know, we're already building this on paper. And then uh, two, <laughs> two days later, we realized, hang on a second, it's actually a really bad idea because books are super bad, are super difficult to standardize. They have low ticket sizes. So what, the book is somewhere between 10 and 50 francs or, or euros. Um, there's low margins in the in the secondhand resale. It's very difficult to standardize, and generally speaking, there's kind of already another player which is a little bit significant. And it's Amazon. So okay, yeah. that that thing's over. Uh, but we like the idea of trading consumer goods like like financial products. And uh, both my co-founder and I were kind of watch geeks always. Um, I worked in a watch shop after um, finishing my IB, so kind of the high school diploma. Um, and as a result, we just started looking into it and realized there's no no marketplace online to, to buy watches properly and to have a, a kind of a fully integrated experience. And so we just kind of thought, all right, let's, uh, let's give it a go. Um, and yeah, here we are. And then, wait, you, so you decided, let's go to Switzerland and found it there instead of in the UK. Well, we started the business in London in our kitchen, uh, but we formally incorporated it uh, in Switzerland the, the first time we did built the website and uh, most of the things that we that we did at the beginning in the UK, but only when we really went live commercially, um, that, that's when we, we went to Switzerland to do it properly. Just because, you know, Swiss watches, Swiss timepieces, Swiss company. Just oh, sense. so it, it's less about perhaps the incentives for startups here in Switzerland and more about the market. Well, to be honest, I think um, we were just extremely bad at looking at incentives uh, in different geographies. Uh, we got a loan from from the from the UK government, Startup Britain was called. I think it was eight eight thousand pounds at the time. Um, so we just kind of started it there because we we had a flat and our parents were paying for it, uh, so we had no overheads. Um, but to be honest, I think. If I was to start a business again, uh, we would do much better research if there's any subsidies, uh, depending on the geography that you're in. Um, and and yeah, I, I guess Switzerland has a very good landscape for that. We just never really looked into it. Yeah. You, you said you did a bachelor's at King's College and then you went on to Cambridge. Yes. How has your experience at these two premier educational institutes helped you in what you're doing now? So I think that, um, you know, both. Both universities uh, are obviously very good names um, that look nice on the CV. Um, one of the things that, um, that that has really helped is especially Cambridge, I think the alumni network. Um, if I look at the specific degrees that I did, so at King's there was business management and, and I focused on kind of venture capital and innovation. Um, and in Cambridge there was a master of philosophy um, and innovation strategy organization. So, um, both these things seem kind of related. 
they were very classic academic um, courses where in my opinion the business world evolves much faster than kind of conventional academia and as a result um, it, it, there was not so much stuff that I could usefully apply to, to running a business. Um, I was never told throughout um, Kings where we have marketing modules what Google AdWords is. So uh, nowadays it's the most obvious thing in the world but uh, if you think about marketing 101 that should be included right but it wasn't um, and we made a lot of mistakes correspondingly so I think at least for my academic experience I wouldn't say it didn't help but to kind of start a business from scratch with a few hundred or a few thousand pounds um, that, that education didn't really help me. What it did help me in a kind of indirect way is to, to work on the time pressure, to work to deadlines and to obviously uh, look at complex uh, issues but not directly being told how to do online marketing or to start an accounting, um, kind of how to actually do accounting properly, uh, not, not from a kind of case study but actually to set up your own accounts etc. Um, yeah, we, we didn't look yeah. Yeah, um, when did you decide to actually start a company of your own? Was it always a plan when you began your studies? Or did it just happen because you had that idea with the books and you're like, well, might as well continue with it? It's a bit of both. So uh, when I came out of King's, um, I actually signed up to a job at Glencore. I'm not sure if you go to Glencore, but um, they are a physical commodities trader, actually also a Swiss business, uh, in the London okay. office and in the oil trading department. So I was thinking of, going, of becoming either an oil trader or going to investment banking. Um, so I was also interviewing at, at Goldman at the time. Um, uh -huh. And uh, I always wanted to become uh, an entrepreneur at some point, but I never really thought of the time frame. I always thought that I'm going <clears> to <throat> go to, I don't know, get a job first, make some money, and then use that money to start a business. Uh, but I guess um, you know, it, everything turned out to be differently. We, we had this idea and everybody told us it's a really bad idea, don't do it. And um, we still did it um, because we thought it makes sense and it's super obvious. Everybody told us it's really unobvious and it's a waste of time. Um, yeah. Still did it um, and it worked out so, so gladly I'm here. But um, I think, yeah, to answer your question shortly, I always wanted to become an entrepreneur, but I thought I would do it at a much later stage. And um, I was never really sure what that meant to start something. I mean, it sounds very nice and romantic to have your own business, but actually to incorporate your company. Um, so you actually, you know, you need to find a lawyer or a notary and you need to go to the commercial register, etc. You know, I had no idea yeah. how to do that. So we, we just figured it out as, as, as it went and that's kind of how it happened. Now, as you said uh, before we started recording the podcast, you said academia has a very uh, naive theoretical view of what it is to start a business. Could, could you elaborate on that? Why do you think that way? I think naive is maybe the wrong word. Um, what, what I think academia helps you to understand static concepts. And academica, uh, academia, by, you know, by, as I experienced it, is something that evolves in a, it evolves, it, it evolves constantly, but in a kind of very controlled pace. Yeah, somebody will write a study uh, or a paper. Somebody else will read it. It'll take another few months to respond, etc. And so things continue. Um, mm -hmm. But actually, you know, especially the modern digitalized or digitalizing uh, business world is maybe not always agile, but it has a very dynamic and kind of developing into an agile environment. What I mean with that is. You know, you make theories um, or you have a um, hypothesis and then you test it. Yeah? So if we go into markets, into new markets, for instance, other than academia, for instance, where you would probably build a case study uh, on, you know, how it is to enter the, I don't know, Japanese or Korean market. Um, but what you do in the real world, you say, okay, you have a test budget of, let's say, 100,000 euros. Um, and uh, you start testing various marketing channels and you will actually see how the performance of these marketing channels is and what your revenues look like. And then after that, you look at the economics and you say, okay, obviously this marketing channel worked, this marketing channel didn't, or maybe this geography as a whole didn't work. But this kind of over uh, engineering of theory, pre-making decisions, uh, at least at, uh, you know how we were told at the time, um, is not really applicable to, to the business world. 
at least not that of a startup that uh, grows a few hundred percent a year. Yeah, so, in, so what you're saying is in reality, everything runs at a much faster rate than it does in an academic setting. Yes. How could we bridge this gap? Say, like, there are many aspiring entrepreneurs. How can we bridge this educational gap during our studies to be better prepared for when we're ready to start a startup? I think, um, I think that's a difficult one. At the end of the day, there's only so much that professors can do, right? Because they are experts mm -hmm. in their fields, but the real experts are the guys that are doing the business rather than kind of writing about it. At least that's what I would say. Maybe that's a, the pro a provocative statement, but that's, that's my personal opinion. Um, <clears throat> the, best, the best advice you think is just to go do it and learn. Yeah, on your I own. mean, I think the best thing is probably not to just do it because you're going <laughs> to potentially lose a lot of money. But um, I think, <laughs> you know, the difference between academics and practitioners is academics uh, write the theory, practitioners practice the theory. Um, courses, especially for people who are interested in entrepreneurship, in the kind of more conventional sense, and by entrepreneurship I don't mean kind of management consultants, um, starting their own management consultancy, but actually people who want to um, have have a business in a, in a new field or want to kind of um, do, a, do a business based on operational innovation is to have courses um, or curricula then that um, include a lot of kind of practitioners, entrepreneurs that visit universities and that speak about their experiences. You will never be able to fully transcend what you do on a daily basis into theory unless that's something that really doesn't change that often, especially in, in digital businesses that's, that's all the time. But what you can transport is the essence of thinking. And I think that yeah. um, if, if, if universities integrate uh, practitioners in a better way, um, and I'm not sure how it is at ETH, um, I, I only know that it's a very good university, so maybe you guys are more advanced there, but uh, at least at, at the time when I studied, um, there, there was little integration of practitioners. There was a lot of extracurricular stuff, but actually in the modules there was no integration of people uh, who I thought were interesting or relevant to what we do today and to how I think the, the world is changing and evolving. Yeah. Could you give us a few differences since you work in the UK, Germany, and Switzerland? Yeah. Going to you, what have you noticed as a difference in the market or in the practices or or in the buyers and customers? Do you see something that's not so apparent otherwise? I think the there's always differences, uh, especially um, on the legal side. There's obviously differences, um, but at the end of the day, the, the biggest differences in different environments are, are cultural aspects, um, how people are. Uh, I think it's, it's similar if you go on vacation to these geographies that you would see it. Um, everything is a bit slower in Switzerland, especially in negotiations. <laughs> uh, if you if you if you negotiate in Switzerland. Uh, you can't be aggressive about it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are uh, aggressive in Germany, that works reasonably well. And if you're aggressive in the UK, it depends on how you're aggressive in your negotiation. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, in, it's, it's cultural things that, that make a huge difference. Um, and, you know, my experience in the UK is that people over-engineer legal documents. Uh, people are more pragmatic mm -hmm. about that in Switzerland. Um, in Germany, everything is, is, is done according to the rules, which is similar in Switzerland, but people tend to try to find a way to, to accommodate uh, you know, the needs around the situation. Um, yeah. But there, yeah, there are too many specific examples to generalize, but I think culture obviously makes the biggest difference in, in how, how it's worked in those environments. Yeah. Do, do you retail all over the world or are you only focused in Europe? So at the moment we um, focus on, on four geographies, Germany, Austria, Switzerland and the UK. Um, and we are launching 130 markets uh, over the course of this year um, from That's Switzerland. So far, who, uh, who's been the biggest spender out of these four countries? Um, Possibly the Swiss, I'm assuming. The Swiss and the Germans that change all the time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What would you say are some advantages of starting a startup here in Switzerland? I mean, the, the good thing for us, um, there's, there's not a lot of uh, prominent startups, at least that I know, uh, from Switzerland. So as a result, uh, we got a lot of press coverage. Um, we, we even got a few uh, Swiss politicians to write us uh, congratulatory letters uh, on press clippings that we had that actually helped to get bank loans, etc. 
Um, oh. but, uh, Wait, yeah. you, do you mean that since there's not so much entrepreneurship going on, it was easier for you to get press coverage locally? Yes, definitely. Wow. Yeah, so you, you, you stick out more. Um, the, the big advantage to Switzerland is I think, you know, you have very smart people there. Um, I think in terms of kind of uh, commercial registers, law, um, anything to do with legal stuff, Switzerland is pretty straightforward. Uh, the big disadvantage obviously is the, the huge HR costs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Have, have you had any big name sales so far? Any celebrity sales or something? Uh, we did, but I, but I obviously can't. Uh, much <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, on to a more personal question. What, what was one big failure in your life? In my life or in, in my chronic business life? Whatever you'd like to talk about. What do you think so far has been the biggest learning experience in your yeah. life? I think um, if I think about the, the biggest kind of uh, failure, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint. Uh, I guess we, you know, we're speaking about professional life, so uh, there's been so many little, uh, I'm not going to swear, but mistakes that we made um, throughout the whole business. It's difficult to pinpoint the single biggest one. I think if I had to, um, the, we went where we were way too naive when we started the business. Uh, we didn't have a business plan. We uh, didn't even know how long our money would last. Um, we kind of lived into the day, and it was more kind of like a bohemian. Let's just like go to work and see what's going to happen. A thing rather than kind of execution driven uh, building a business like we are now. Um, I think this was a big mistake and. The, the biggest mistake probably was that we just didn't do any marketing for the first year. Uh, we just thought, you know, we'd go live and people would know about it. But if you think about it, it's it's bullshit because, you know, nobody waits for you. And if you guys were to start a business today, how would I find out about it, right? You need to market yeah. it. Um, so we didn't do that. Uh, and that really cost us a lot of time and money. I think uh, if we uh, started the business over again with the knowledge that we have now, we would probably be where we are in half the time. So. Uh, that's probably the biggest mistake. At what point did you start raising money for your company? Uh, pretty much from day one, but it took us one and a half years to do it properly before anybody really gave us money. Wait, so like on day one, you started going ask without anything. You just started asking people. Correct. Yeah, well, we did have a nice PowerPoint, but uh, nobody really. Did that. <laughs> <laughs> and at what point were people willing to give you money, or investors, or did you have to prove that you had users or? Yeah. A concept. Yeah, and we had to show that there was obviously some initial traction to what we were doing. It's, it's very difficult to, um, to to convince somebody to give you a million or two um, when when everything you're talking about is theoretical. Now, if we were to do it today, given the track record that we have, I have people probably would do it, right? Because <coughs> they know you can pull it off. But when you are 21, 22 years old, you just got out of university and you want to have two, three million euros. Um, and you have nothing to show for it, then it's a difficult case to make. So um, the more proof of concept you have, the, the better it is. Mm -hmm. How do you sustain yourself running a startup? Um, <laughs> Which we all know is really stressful. Yeah, I mean, you know, stress is a state of mind, right? So um, what's stressful to you may not be stressful to me and, and vice versa. I think, um, you know, I, I remember as a student, I used to hate revising for, for exams, and what I did, I actually stood in front of the mirror and said, I really feel like revising, and I said it 10 times, and then it wasn't as bad anymore. So I guess it's the same thing with a startup, it's um, just conditioning, there's obviously uh, a lot of things that you do that you love, and there's a lot of things that you do that you fundamentally hate, um, there's no such thing as, as an amazing job. I think that... Um, you know, you're asking me if I have any habits. I don't have any habits that I think that are um, extremely beneficial in, in running and starting a business. Uh, in fact, I, I take very little notes, so uh, I'm not organized in the conventional sense of the word. I, I, I send emails to myself all the time uh, with, with kind of keywords that I don't want to forget. Um, but yeah. what I what I do, um, I think I'm, I'm incredibly kind of paranoid of forgetting things. So as a result, most of the people that work with me are constantly pestered about things that we spoke about. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but it definitely keeps them going, um, whether that's the right approach or not. Um, it has worked so far, but I think um, the most important thing that you that you learn as a founder is to, to continuously question yourself 
Um, but at the same time, to be confident when you do make that decision. Um, and to be also confident um, to, to actually say, you know what, that was the wrong decision. Let's ignore what I, what I said. So um, what are your future plans like? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Still expanding Chronix or do you want to expand further to some other vertical? I think that, you know, Chronix has a huge potential. Um, where we are right now is probably two, three percent of where we, where we can be. The, the industry as a whole is somewhere between 60 and 90 billion euros per year in terms of the luxury watch industry. Um, hypothetically speaking, <clears throat> you can also go into other verticals such as, I don't know, jewelry, handbags, diamonds, whatever. Um, I'm not saying that we will do that, um, but I think that opportunities evolve. Um, I definitely see that this is a that this this could be one of the biggest e-commerce businesses coming out of Europe, um, and that's what I want to build. Uh, obviously, you know, being an entrepreneur and having done this once, I'll probably want to do uh, something else um, on the side at, at some other point. Um, but as far as I see from now, I can do products for the rest of my life. So. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Yeah. What's your personal incentive in growing a really large business? Do you want the money, the fame? What's like driving you? Um, if I'm completely honest, I don't actually know. Um, I think that uh, <laughs> it's just something that is there or it's not there. Um, you know, having a nice salary and maybe a little bit of a even nicer salary is obviously nice, you know. I'm not sure if you've seen the film Blow, where Johnny Depp is a, a drug dealer, but he says, <laughs> yes. he says it's nice to have nice things, right? Um, yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, I think there's there's a the, the kind of utility curve on, on owning a nice car or even having, I don't know, uh, 10 houses, kind of the, the, the shape of that function changes very quickly. So um, the, the utility only increases marginally with more money. So I don't think that's the case. Uh, that, that, that drives uh, most entrepreneurs, or at least doesn't drive me. Uh, at the end of the day, I think it's you know it's like being an athlete or a sportsman. You just think about something, you want to achieve it. People tell you it's not doable or it's very difficult, and you just want to prove them wrong. And I think that um, we we went into the arena of luxury watches. Um, it's one of the oldest industries in the world, and we are uh, fundamentally trying to change how retail in this industry works. People have started taking notice and people have started to respect us. Still, we are uh, the kind of guerrilla warfare uh, guys, still quite small in industry. And to actually show others that they were wrong and that we are, in fact, that we can change the theme of, of, a, of a structure, um, I mm -hmm. think that's what, what drives me mostly. Awesome. Yeah. Now, on your LinkedIn page, it's very explicitly listed that you're hiring. Yes. Now, what are you looking for? Um, I mean, we always, I mean, the thing that I would always hire more than less of is business intelligence people. Um, how we, we call them business intelligence people, they're probably business analysts. At the end of the day, it's people mm -hmm. that are good with numbers, they can spot trends, uh, they can uh, build hypotheses, and they can prove them or disprove them with data. Uh, we try to be as data driven as possible, so anybody who's good with numbers, uh, feel free to, to write me on LinkedIn. Generally speaking, what do we look for in people? We look for people who think um, outside the bounds of, of what's conventionally correct or, or wrong. Um, there's no such thing as, as a stupid question here at, at Chronix, um, unless the question obviously is really stupid. But, um, <laughs> but uh, generally, we, we question everything that we do. And um, we, we, we do our best to build an environment which is truly a meritocracy. So, uh, the best idea and, and the best person wins. So, um, you know, data, an opinion is good, but uh, data is better. Um, so yeah. anybody from, from ETH um, who's good with data and is interested to, to join probably the fastest luxury e-commerce in the world and uh, is obviously invited to join. Um, more abstractly, we look for people who are, um, who, who are very driven, uh, who, who don't want to work nine to five, who like the idea of having to pull an all-nighter once in a while, uh, who want to work in an environment which is um, high intensity, high stress, but also very rewarding, um, and, and people who, who um, don't see work as something that, that ends once you leave the office. Um, and yeah, people who want to have fun on the job as well, obviously. Okay. 
Classy. That sounds fantastic, Philip. Like one last question before we wind this up. Sure. Now, this is a question we ask every guest. Yeah. Um, it's simply, what's on your bookmarks bar? Uh, bookmarks bar. Yeah. Um, I don't actually have one. Um, oh. Because I never look at bookmarks. What I usually do is I have like 50 tabs that are open. Um, <laughs> what is on my, my tabs? Um, mainly articles about the watch market that I should that I should read. I have an article now um, that how you could hypothetically be faster than the speed of light. Uh, I haven't read that yet though. Um, there's a few tabs on Chronex with product sites where there's maybe mistakes or errors which I forward to the team and I keep them open to see if they change it. Um, yeah. What else is there? Um, open flights that I need to book after this call, YouTube videos of competitors talking incorrect things about watches. Um, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide mix of things. Yeah, yeah, it seems like a lot of what you do is just analyzing the market. Yeah, I mean, you could, I guess what you can say is as the business grows, at the beginning it's different, right? So at the beginning when you start a business, you know, you bought a fridge, you don't have a fridge in the office, you need to get that fridge into the office. There's no elevator, you carry the thing up. Then, uh, <laughs> then, you, then you transform the, the business to where you get other people to carry up the fridge, right? So you, you order the fridge, you tell them it's going to be on the curb at 12 a.m. and please put it up there. And then you, um, you, you, you check if they've done it and if the fridge is in the location that you want it to have. And then we are now uh, at a level of the business where we have people who tell other people to buy the fridge and to put it in the location. <laughs> And you create a culture where you, rather than checking if the fridge is in the right place, where the culture self-reinforces so that people don't need to be told this is where the fridge needs to go, but so they are thinking in a way that they ideally find the right way to order the right fridge and place it in the right location in the office. Um, so this, what I do is essentially I create a framework now um, under which we're building a team which manages a larger team. So Chronix can become a platform for maybe a thousand people someday um, that to to really to build a fundamentally um, you know changing luxury commerce. And um, so most of the things that you do are not directly um, you know you you don't maybe you don't build your own PowerPoint presentations anymore and you don't uh, you know carry on fridges anymore. Um, but what you do is um, you you create a culture and an environment within which other people can kind of excel. So it's it's a lot to do with checking, um, and it's also obviously checking if other people are doing the right job. Um, and to rather than say you know this was shit, but to explain why it was shit, and to make sure that you build a process that that negative thing doesn't repeat, and uh, that the positive thing continues to repeat yeah? because people always look at negative stuff but actually look at the positive stuff and keep doing that more than focusing on stopping the bad stuff. <clears throat> That's kind of what I do. Well, Not sure that makes sense uh, with the fridge, but I hope it did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Was that a true story though? Did you actually have to carry your fridge? Um, to be honest, I did have to, but I got a few people who were uh, so there was a construction site next to our first office and I paid the construction workers a few pounds into their hands and they carried it up for us. But I would have had to do it myself, but I didn't do it. <laughs> well, that, that makes sure that you are the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Philip. Perfect. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you liked it, we'd really appreciate it if you shared it and gave us your feedback. We publish a new episode every week. For more details, visit our website simplified.xyz.